we're here today to talk about um, a tax that was imposed uh, this January 1st, uh, and that is the highway use tax. Uh, we are asking today that our Democrat colleagues and the governor join us in repealing a tax that's been repealed in 21 other states. Uh, what we've seen right now and what you're going to hear from today are people from all walks of life who are going to talk about the impact that this tax has had on their businesses, on their con constituent groups, um, just over the past month. And uh, we would like to have this dialogue and continue it. I think this isn't a bill that we just pass and forget about. We need to really understand the implications that this is having uh, on the state of Connecticut. And so with that, we are going to start. Sorry about that. I'm just going to wait a minute. And so with that, we are going to start with uh, Dave Palumbo from Palumbo Trucking in North Brantford. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Representative Candelora. Um, I, I, I can't appreciate enough uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, I'm a family-run business for uh, almost 35 years, and um, this, this bill is going to impact us in multiple ways. Uh, the cost alone is a magnitude of anywhere from about $150,000 to $170,000 to my company um, that we don't really know how we're going to afford this other than passing it on to every consumer that's in this room. Everybody is going to pay for this. Everybody in the state of Connecticut is going to pay. Um, it, it's, to me, this wasn't thought out hard enough, long enough, with any kind of consensus of, of how this is going to work, how it's going to be audited. Um, it's, it's not only um, discombobulated, it's discriminatory because we're, I, I own tractor trailers. Uh, you know, class, you know, seven, eight trucks on up to 13 are getting taxed trucks from class seven down or not you're telling me that they don't do as much damage to the roads as as the, as everybody in the state saying that tractor trailers do you know um i i just you know on top of all the other taxes our irp taxes for which is which was supposed to get rid of these the last four remaining states in the union for our irp if you don't know what irp is international registration plan that was supposed to cover some of these other costs well only Connecticut now with four other states are doing it. And I'm hoping that, I'm hoping the governor, I'm hoping, you know, legislators, senators, Congress people can get together and, and look at this bill hard and fast because, you know, I'm proud to be an owner in Connecticut. I'm proud to, to have about, you know, 60, 70 people working for me. And I'm proud to give my employees full benefits, full benefits I give them. Where does it get cut? If I got to pay this bill, somebody's going to, something's going to happen. So I thank Vinny Candelora for this, and um, thank you for your time. Much appreciated. And thank you, thank you, uh, Dave. Next we have Joe Ciccarella from Lumber Dealers Association of Connecticut. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Ciccarelli. I'm from Northford, Connecticut. But I am the legislative chair for the Lumber Dealers Association of Connecticut, which represents every independent lumber dealer, building material dealer, manufacturers, wholesale distributors, and other associated businesses. As a group, we employ over 35,000 hardworking people in this state. As an association, we support the full repeal of the highway tax use. It has added additional operating expenses to deliveries and bottom line adds anywhere from 2 to 4% over the total cost of a project. That represents that homeowners in this state looking to build a deck, looking to put a family room addition on, do a build out on a in-law apartment or the like may have to decide whether they do it at all or wait until things get better with the economy and the additional costs that we're seeing incurred. Construction depends 
on the prompt delivery of building materials, sometimes multiple times a week. And adding these additional costs can make the difference in the success, okay, for our member companies, let alone, okay, the dreams and aspirations of Connecticut homeowners that are looking to add and make their castle the way they want. <clears throat> in addition, we feel this tax lead to, leads to a differential treatment with in and out of state truckers because there's no enforcement mechanism if a driver fails to register. With Connecticut being surrounded by three states, we look to see contractors reaching out to other border states that aren't encumbered by this highway use tax to purchase building materials at a lower price. Bottom line, what this leaves is all of our member yards and associate members, the trades that we support in the economy of Connecticut, okay, holding the bag. What it also impacts is the lack of sales tax that the state would collect on the many projects that our members supply in the communities that they have served collectively over the last 120 years. Thank you for having me today, and the Lumber Dealers Association of Connecticut will always be and stay a working partner for the betterment of this state. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Stephen Sack of Sachs Energy, West Hartford. Thank you for your time today. We are asking the state to repeal this tax. This tax is supposed to generate $90 million a year, and this money is going to come out of the residents of the state. The, these fees that they've imposed on this is going to get passed down the line and affect all residents of Connecticut. Everything you own, everything everybody does here was on a truck that came into the state. Your food, your fuel, your medicine, your clothes, your building materials, everything comes in by tractor trailer and it's going to be passed right down to the consumer. We seem to have plenty of funds to fix our highways and do what we need and this money will probably be diverted into the general fund like a lot of the fuel taxes have been through the years and we were asking for this to be repealed because it's unnecessary, it's unfair. Many out-of-state trucking companies or single owner-operator truckers will not comply with these rules and so it's going to be charged mainly to those local Connecticut companies and not fairly. And we just don't need this money, we don't need the funds the state doesn't and the consumers in the state don't need to get, pay out another $90 million a year to cover this fee. That's unnecessary. Thank you. And next we have uh, Richard Fitzgerald from Blake Street uh, Pre-Stress Inc., Brantford. Good morning. Um, I'm the VP of Operations for Blakesley Pre-Stress Incorporated. We're a major precast uh, producer um, and we're a major subcontractor in the state of Connecticut. Um, we've been in the business for 65 years. Um, we are not in the trucking business, um, but we rely on trucking companies like Palumbo to uh, deliver uh, raw materials to our product projects. Um, we employ 150 people, we're a union shop, and erect our projects with union trades. The increase cost, this, this, in, this increased cost of manufacturing and shipping and delivery of our products. Um, sand, stone, cement, admixtures, rebar, precessing strand, we get 4,000 inbound loads a year and probably three to 5,000 outbound loads a year, all of which are gonna be we're going to have to pay the tax on that, and it makes us less competitive in the market. So we will potentially lose jobs as a result of this. Um, um, that's all I have to say today. Appreciate you guys taking the time. Thank you, Vinny. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joan Nichols. I'm the executive director for Connecticut Farm Bureau Association. We represent nearly 2,000 500 farm families in the state of Connecticut. We're a $4.2 billion industry in the state of Connecticut and supply almost 20, over 20,000 jobs. Since this bill was first introduced, we have been trying to impress upon 
everybody in this building, the executive branch, the legislative branch, our farmers are experiencing some of the highest input costs they have experienced in decades. We are dealing with a global economy. What is going on in the Ukraine has direct impact on our farmers here in Connecticut. We're pleading for everybody in this building, both sides of the aisle, all branches of government, to look at this tax and the impact it's having on our Connecticut farm businesses. They are getting squeezed, the profit margin on an already fragile and marginal industry is getting squeezed even further, and our farms cannot pass this on, oftentimes to consumers, because they need to be competitive in a regional economy. So I'm asking, pleading with you, please look at this tax, look at where the federal money is coming from, look at what we've done with federal money in the past for infrastructure. We all want safe roads and bridges, but let's be smart about how we're utilizing these funds and what we're doing for our Connecticut farm businesses and all businesses in Connecticut. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. And next, we have Seth Baylor from Oak Ridge Dairy, Ellington. All right. Thank you. Uh, I am a fifth-generation farmer in Ellington, Connecticut. My great-great-grandfather started the farm back in 1890. Um, we produce about 25,000 gallons of milk per day, and we also truck in uh, feed for, to feed all our cows. We move a hun hundreds of thousands of tons every single year, and this tax is just another way to uh, get into our pockets. It's, it's really hard for us as farmers. Connecticut is probably one of the most highest cost production state for dairy farmers across the country and we're competing, like Joan said, in a world market. Uh, we cannot pass uh, the price on to consumers. Our price is set by a federal order um, based off of supply and demand in a world market, so we cannot pass this on. So this cuts right into our pockets. You know, we truck a lot of feed every single day for our cows, and this is hurting us really bad. So please uh, remove this tax. Thank you. And now we have uh, Brennan Sheehan from Connecticut Mulch Enfield. Thank you so much for having me down here, Representative Cantor Laura. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak before you today to talk about the burden that this tax is having on our small business that the, the Lindelin family has up in Enfield, Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut Mulch has been around for 47 years. Uh, we're very proud of our operation. We're a landscape materials uh, business that uh, helps beautify the state of Connecticut with all the materials that we distribute throughout the state of Connecticut. Uh, we're, we have over 40 trucks on the road daily, and this tax is very burdensome to the bottom line of our company. Um, we've had to hire an additional employee to help just administer this tax itself. Uh, we have to uh, pay, we're estimating over $150,000 in tax that's coming off the bottom line of the company. Uh, we're trying to provide jobs to the local folks up there in the Enfield region, and this tax will take away from that opportunity for others to have these jobs. So please, do what you can to repeal this tax. Thank you. And finally, we have Ray uh, Walters from RNS Trucking, North Haven. Yeah, well, thank you for having me here. And as everybody else has been saying, it's going to impact, you know, I'm, I'm a small business owner, 10 trucks working on a small profit margin. And this is just going to hurt without being able to pass it on. So we'll do the best to pass it on if we can. But to be competitive, you know, a lot of times you're not going to be able to do that. So it's uh it's going to be a burden. Thank you. I think everyone, I think we have everyone who wanted to speak. Um, I, I want to recognize also John Blair, who is here from Motor Transport, on behalf of his association um, for this tax. You know, it, it's very rare in this building to see this many people coming up for a press conference. I think it's significant uh, and shouldn't be lost on anyone. They are this compelled to take a day off from work to come here and give their side of the story because of the impact this is going to have on, on their businesses and the families that they employ. 
Uh, as a manufacturer myself, uh, I know what this tax is doing to us. It's very difficult and costly being so close to New York. Every truck having to cross over the bridges to get to Connecticut are paying over $100 per truck to get here. Suggesting that we should pile on because New York has piled on uh, doesn't put us in a co competitive position and frankly has further uh, constrained our trucks from being able to enter the state to move goods and services around. Uh, our fear is that we are not going to feel, uh, well, when we feel the impacts of this, it's going to be too late. Um, we are asking DRS to provide the information and look at it carefully because if we are not meeting the projections of the tax collected, it suggests two things. Businesses are restricting their behavior in order to avoid the tax, which isn't good for commerce. And number two, businesses from out of state aren't going to be complying with it. Um, we've seen studies in New York and nationally elsewhere that this tax uh, is avoided by up to 50% of businesses that are subjected to it. So it's not a tax that is fair and the businesses that will be paying it are the ones that are located in the state of Connecticut. Um, and so with that, we have uh, Holly Cheeseman here as well, who is our ranking member of finance, and we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. I have an opportunity to uh, speak to the governor um, before your uh, event here and uh, ask him about uh, this particular issue. And this is what he basically said. Uh, the burden falls mostly on uh, out-of-state truckers. He uh, said 80% of the registered uh, companies are, are out-of-state. Uh, this revenue from this tax is going to be needed to support future transportation spending that's going to benefit all Connecticut-based users of the highways, including motor carriers and other businesses that rely on trucking, that will need to fix our roads bridges and not fixing our roads and bridges is bad for the trucking industry and other businesses. So I, I think first, um, we're still awaiting the data of how many businesses within the state of Connecticut versus out of state has paid it. So I don't think that anyone is in a position to say this is mostly going to fall on businesses outside this Connecticut. And the fact that you're already hearing from a dozen here today would suggest otherwise. Um, the burden may fall on some of them outside the state or the obligation to pay, but we don't believe that out-of-state trucking companies are going to necessarily pay this. Uh, New York has a 50% collection rate. So to suggest that Connecticut is going to do any better is questionable. Um, in terms of the special transportation fund, I think that that's a global issue that we need to have. And I think that the fact that Connecticut has mismanaged that fund for decades doesn't make it right to put the burden on these industries to pay this tax. This money will go into the coffers and we will do the same as usual of heavily subsidizing train and rail in the state of Connecticut to a point that it's unaffordable. Um, and there's no suggestion or plan to get our special transportation fund out of the red. Now, right now we have a six projected, I think through 2025, to have a $600 million surplus. So I would suggest that we take a break on this, take a real hard look at our special transportation fund. Let's look at a transit authority to look at how we are spending uh, before we move forward with this devastating tax. Yes, and I, I will echo what Representative Candelora said. And given that we don't have the data, we are seeing family-run businesses employing Connecticut residents up here pleading with you. I think too often in this legislature, the assumption is, oh, don't worry, they're big out-of-state trucking companies, they're big corporations. No, these are men and women who bet everything every day that that business is going to be there, that the people they employ are going to have jobs, th who will buy houses and raise children in this state. And too often we implement policies that forget the effect on the people who are standing here with us today. And my plea, again to the governor, to the rest of the legislature, is listen to these voices. We are bonding to provide the federal match for so, so much of that federal infrastructure money, something this governor said he wasn't prepared to do, yet we are doing that because we are constantly told this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with these federal dollars. We don't need to reach in the pockets of the men and women here to provide that match. So take a pause, take a break, 
let's look at this holistically. If we really wanted to be serious, given the goal of this administration and the state is to totally transition away from fossil fuel vehicles, how are we going to fill the transportation fund going forward? Have a serious conversation. But we don't need this money now, so let's take a pause and have a smart conversation. Follow up with you, uh, Representative. You said New York has a 50% uh, compliance rate. Well, I imagine supporters of the tax will say that's because 50% of the trucks can go through Connecticut without having to pay that tax. So now that Connecticut has a tax and New York has a tax, how do you get to Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine? The, the, study, the, study that, the studies show it's it's a fifty percent evasion rate. Yeah. So it's regardless of which they're not they're not evading by driving around New York. They're just not paying the tax when they're obligated to do so. Because that, that's what the I, I'll get you the study. I mean I, I didn't write it and research it, but but that was the information uh, that I actually looked through uh, that they had said. But the, and the reality is, twenty one states have repealed this. 21 states. We have, we just joined four. We're now the fifth state to impose this at a time when 21 states repealed it. That alone should get everybody pause. Can I ask, uh, uh, how do you get around uh, How does the, the tax bill, the new tax bill appear to you? Does it show up in the mail or, or uh, Somebody calling. Oh, it's, it's all self-reporting. We've had to hire staff to administer, track, and account for this tax. It's a it's a burden through our personnel management where that that individual could be putting time more well spent on making our company more efficient and more profitable. But now we're forced to track it, and it's it really falls back on the drivers to account for are they in Massachusetts today? How many miles? Were they back in Connecticut? It's a nightmare, and logistically to account for all of this and to put that burden upon small businesses in the state of Connecticut is really shameful. We should come up with a much better plan if we're going to do something moving forward. And is this a daily reporting that, that, that you're trying we to We have to track it daily so we can uh, report it monthly, I believe, monthly, I believe. Every and and uh, it, it's time consuming. And, uh, can you find out how this uh, has affected fee costs, uh, your, your fee costs up in Ellington for your house? You, you said it's gone up. I mean, can you give us an, an idea? Yeah. How much? I mean, you know, I don't want you to necessarily yeah, share so, business secrets, but you know, if you could give us an idea. Yeah. Know, the, the so just cost. just take it for instance. So our milk price is set by federal order, um, and half of it goes directly to feed costs every month. Half of it, probably even more. So our feed costs in the past year and a half is based off commodities, but it's increased about 40%. Um, and to go back to your point, going around Connecticut, uh, going through Connecticut, no trucker wants to drive through Connecticut. <laughs> and if I could, in answer to that, as far as driving around Connecticut, in the wholesale operation that I run and help run from Durham, Connecticut, we have hardwood deliveries, finished goods coming out of the south. The companies we buy from use independent truckers. Independent truckers are paid by the trip. And the less hours they sit behind the wheel, the more money they generate for themselves. So any trucker that's coming into our state, whether he's got to go through it or make a delivery into it, is going to find the shortest point between the street line between two points because it's money out of their pocket if they come. Hey, Mr. Powell, what, what, do you, what do you think of the ability of the, of the, the DRS to uh, identify and hold to account uh, tax evaders, hut evaders? Well, I mean, we're still, again, waiting on the data of, of what has even been reported and collected. Um, and I'm not sure it's all the will of, of the agency and whether or not they're interested in going to out-of-state companies um, to audit them. But, but I think generally speaking, A, I'm not sure they really have that ability, not sure they have the staff or the efficiency. And so the burden of this tax does end up falling you know, onto our in-state um, businesses. And I think, again, we need to look at what is the, the impact, what is the benefit that the state is really deriving versus the harm that it's causing. And I think when this tax was imposed, 
there really wasn't an understanding of that harm. It was done during the COVID sessions when um, we were really blocked out from the outside world. And so we think that, that we need to have a conversation now, sooner than later. Nobody envisioned the supply chain disruptions and costs that were incurred as a result of COVID. Um, and this has just compounded the problem. What you sense the willingness of uh, Democrats to uh, entertain us? It seems the governor is, is, is still supportive of the attack, but you know. I think that there is genuine concern around this building from Democrats and Republicans of the impact this is going to have on, on their local businesses. And we, we've seen it over time where there are Democrats that have come forward um, and said we need to look at this, you know, especially in the agricultural fields. Um, we, we think we need a broader conversation. You know, the governor, unfortunately, has really, uh, you know, dug in. I've had a conversation with him on this, um, and he, he's, he's dug in on this position. And I just really think that we, we need to look at it again. And, and I'm not willing, if we're going into a, uh, a budget cycle with surpluses and a transportation fund that currently has a surplus, we're, I think we're, very well, po we're very, very well poised to put a pause on this program. What about long term? I mean, would you prefer to see the gas tax, which is a broader tax? to bolster the special transportation fund, because you're correct. The next couple of years, they're projecting surpluses. But I would, prefer, I would pr prefer to have a conversation about the spending first before the revenue. The special transportation fund, oddly, has always led the conversation with revenue. And when you're looking at Shoreline East, where the state is subsidizing every ticket $106, of state tax dollars that a passenger is receiving from the state to ride Shoreline East, we have to have a broader conversation of is our public transportation system and spending working? And to suggest that we could just keep raising taxes and putting it on the backs of businesses and residents in the state of Connecticut for transportation systems that aren't even being utilized. Uh, one example, we spent, we bonded millions of dollars for parking garages in Hartford. If, if we truly are serious about public transportation, why are we building parking garages in our, in our urban centers? And I'm not critical of that. We need parking in Hartford. And that suggests that people are just accustomed to driving vehicles in our state. And yet we're putting all this money into trans public transportation that's not being used. And I'd just like to follow up with that. COVID has changed the way we travel, the way we do business, the way we work. Surely, given, you know, we see office buildings empty, we see people working from home remotely, this is the time to have that detailed, sensible conversation based on the reality now not based on what happened in 2021 when, as Representative Candelora said, this was passed in a COVID session. So let's be serious. We are in a different world with different needs, different technology. Let's, let's be smart and proactive and pause this while we have time, while we have a surplus, and really look at this in an intelligent, compassionate way taking into account the needs of the state and our transit system, but the needs of the people who are standing here today and the needs of the residents of Connecticut. Vin, was there, was there a bill that was not raised for a public hearing, which is why you had to petition? That's right. We had wanted the bill raised in the Finance Committee. There was a bill raised on the hut tax for agriculture only. We didn't feel that we should be testifying on that bill and potentially disrupting the intent of what that legislation was doing. Uh, and so we wanted to petition this bill because we believed every entity impacted by this tax should be heard. Why, why this particular? I mean, other Republican bills seem to, or maybe I'm under the mis misimpression here, but I thought other Republican tax bills were, were being put forward at least on the hearing. What, what was the deal with this one? Well, obviously, the impact that it's having on these industries really do concern us um, of, of what it is going to do to our economy in the state of Connecticut. But I also say that the, the hut tax on the agriculture being raised in the Finance Committee, I, I felt that, that our side should be able to be heard on our 
um, bill as well. Yeah, that, I, I guess that's what I'm asking. That doesn't seem an unreasonable ask. So no, it, it, it's a priority for our caucus. We we've heard enough from from these individuals um, and, and how this is going to impact them, and we have real concerns, not just in the fact that it's going to cost businesses to pay, but how is it being collected? Who is really paying it? What is the administrative expenses that are going into these businesses? I mean. People are hiring staff in order to pay this. Uh, upwards of it's costing businesses, um, and I think Plumbo Trucking here could could say how much it's costed him just to administer the tax. If you want to, yeah. So, you know, just to to hire an individual is costing me eighty five thousand dollars a year to put a put a staff member on. That's not that's that's just the administration part. The tax alone is is going to be upwards of. Anywhere to eighty to ninety thousand, upwards to one hundred thousand dollars, as our season gets busier, as every mile we put on in the state. So, you know, you talk about the the, the gas tax that was there was a rebate on the gas tax. We never saw that on diesel. You know, matter of fact, we were paying double and triple amounts for diesel. You know, we were paying five and five fifty a gallon. We're at the pump for diesel today. It's still four sixty nine, four fifty. If you get it in bulk, I'm still at the the high threes. So. You know, on top of, you know, we were paying on an average of, of you know, eighteen to $22,000 a week for fuel. We're now $40,000 a week for fuel. And you want to put this on top of it? What's going to happen in the state of Connecticut? You're going to lose businesses. You're going to get a family-run business, second generation. My kids are coming into the business. that are going to say, why am I doing this? Why do I want to stay here? Sell the business, close the business. I'll put 70 people on unemployment. Is that the right thing for the state of Connecticut? I don't think so. I want to keep growing my business. I don't know how I'm going to grow it when I have a tax like this. We all we all uh, powdered cement throughout the Northeast. Um, we are we are probably one of the largest cement haulers in Connecticut. Uh, we have our main terminal in North Brantford, and we have three rail facilities. We've gone to the extreme to you know to move more material by rail. We've started three rail facilities. Uh, you know, the state of Connecticut loves that, and that's great. But we haul, we haul for the Blake Sea pre-stresses of the world, the United Concretes of the world, the ONGs, the Suzios, the Tilcons. Um, you know, we have a variety of customers. It's all powder cement. So, uh, vehicles total up close to 100. Palumbo Trucking. Were you given a reason why this particular bill wasn't going to be heard in addition to the other bill? I mean, you know, if it's a super secret or you don't want to, you don't want to share it. I mean, well, well I get, I'll put my ranking member on the on the spot. <laughs> and I, I see my compadre, uh, the rank, the uh, chair of finance, sitting here, and I hope she's listening. Uh, I think the feeling was because the, uh, the agriculture bill was on, there was no need to have this one, um, but I, I asked on numerous occasions that we could hear this bill, and unfortunately it, it didn't get raised. But we're, we're having a public hearing Friday, and I think you'll hear from more people who are expressing the sentiments of everybody in this room. And I think that's what we want. A public hearing is about having a conversation. And we're going to have that conversation Friday. And I welcome you all to tune in, because I think you're going to learn even more than you learned here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.